This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. This week in Richmond, and I'm delighted to have three very special guests on. All of our guests are special, but we appreciate the three of you being on. We're having a conversation here at the end of December. It's now January as people are viewing the program. I start down on this end with Andy or Andrew Hagee. I call him Andy. Uh, and I'll talk about each of your areas of expertise in just a moment. Kimberly Gray, Charlie Judd. And probably between the three of you, and then if you added me in too, there's, there must be 75 or more years of experience uh, working on matters around Capitol Square. Uh, Charlie, for, for years, in, in, in this recent vintage portion of his life, has worked on education, on election issues. Kim on education, but and, and, and Andy, economic development has been an area that you've worked in a great deal, even if it didn't involve a specific bill. Our goal in the next 22 or three minutes is to, to help our viewers better understand the, the wide range of issues that are considered here at the General Assembly and how important it is for, for the viewers, for the people back in House and Senate districts to be in touch with their legislators, to help them in the process of what they'll be doing starting January 13th of this year. Kim, as, as uh, the rose here representing education, education being such a big issue, why don't we start with you and then with Charlie and Andy and then the three of you may ignore me if you've got a conversation going and if I want to jump back in, I'll jump in at that time. So, so Kim, you start us off. Well, I'm excited with the new session starting and the governor's proposed budget with a 2% increase for teachers. Our teachers hold the world on their shoulders and I think that it's important that we make education, public education, a priority in this next session. And we'll let our viewers know that since 2008 you've served, you are serving on the City of Richmond School Board. Right. So beyond your personal passion, you have some involvement with it from the school board side. Absolutely. And Things are not as, um, uh, from the state side to the city schools, we are looking at a $1.8 million deficit um, coming from our state funding because of economic development and all the um, state sales tax increases and real estate revenue increases. The state share is decreasing for Richmond schools to the tune about, of about $1.8 million. So we're a little um, concerned about that and we're beginning our budget conversations tonight. How, how does that make any sense? <laughs> or does it? It's, well, the, the formula for funding schools has been one that many legislators have asked for a review and for a study to be done. Um, there are winners and losers whenever you tweak a formula, so right, we right. don't have the, 
the numbers to make that study happen. So I think that there would be too many losers. Um, from the, the way this formula looks at localities, Richmond is the fifth wealthiest locality in the state. But we are battling um, major issues with poverty and other urban issues that other localities don't exactly have to deal with in their schools. A major, major need for that to be to be evaluated. Charlie, you've worked not just in your role, role for four years as chair of the State Board of Elections, but you've worked on a variety of issues. What, get, getting in on the conversation. Well, we have, um, uh, for four years, we focused on trying to um, uh, bring the, electing, uh, the election process in Virginia uh, into the 21st century uh, with technology and, um, and the voter database and the security of that voter database and so forth. And, and we've been able to do that um, recently, um, working toward uh, upgrading the technology. We had mach voting machines in, in Virginia that were older than the people voting on them. And we saw some <laughs> results of that when you have those machines that uh, just fatigue, um, mechanical fatigue sets in. But that, we're, we're on the road to recovery there. And then protecting the integrity of the process was an issue. And while it appeared to be controversial, it has worked out to not be so, and that is uh, identification of the voter. Uh, the drive behind that was to make sure that the person representing themselves at the polling place, when they walk up to the polling place and say, I'm who I am, I'm Charlie Judd, uh, how do we make sure that I'm actually Charlie Judd? And the best way to do it is a photo ID. So here's a photo ID, here's the person standing there, they match, and now we know that nobody else is going to be able to come in and vote and say that they are Charlie Judd. And the good news in, in that implementing is that the first time it was tried, uh, I'm saying the first time it was applied um, uh, statewide, if you don't have a voter, a photo ID, you vote provisionally and then you produce one by the following Friday. That's the process. And it was about 0.001% of people who voted provisionally that didn't have access to a photo ID. I mean, it, it, out, of, out of out of two and a half million votes cast that cycle, it was about 250 or so who had to vote provisionally because they didn't have ID. The whole point is um, everybody has an ID now. So uh, that has tightened up that process. We can have more confidence in the elections that we have in Virginia because of that. And we're looking forward. Okay, thank you. Andy, uh, a lot of the issues you've worked on didn't involve legislation, but still they were important issues to localities. Yeah, it's just uh, <clears throat> trying to get localities uh, more involved in, uh, just not localities, but uh, uh, public officials to businesses right. to even the schools to community, especially community colleges to all become partners in uh, working together on economic development uh, issues and initiatives and uh, educate the general public as well as the benefit of economic development. And economic development is sometimes hard to define, but when right. you boil it down to jobs and uh, tax revenue and, uh, and reducing actually uh, taxes to, to uh, certain localities, if you have a good economic development program and you're generating businesses that are creating the jobs and uh, who's spending the payroll back into the community and then as well as um, equipment and machinery and tool tax and that's generating tax revenue back into the coffers, then of course that's less taxes that the, uh, the public body's got to go to the average tax player, payer to, to receive, uh, to take place of it. So economic development is very important. It pays for, you know, the, the very important services, uh, public safety, but especially schools and uh, schools, are involved in, in a variety of ways besides uh, helping with the budget, but also uh, K through 12 education is very important uh, Then workforce development as well as the community colleges and everybody, we gotta have a trained workforce. So if we don't have that, even too, uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, uh, before the camera started, the, the just the basic uh, skills uh, that are needed out there and seem to be neglected over the years and uh, with a lack of vocational funding of vocational programs and whatnot. And, um, one thing in particular, uh, uh, a state program that's, I think it was initiated last year, but this uh, Rural Virginia Horseshoe Initiative, which is uh, focused on K-12 
It's being administered by the uh, community college system, which is a good, good marriage there between the two. And it's to focus on uh, starting at K through 12 and um, making sure the, uh, uh, the kids at least get a high school education and then move from there to get at least a certificate, much less an associate degree from the community college and then immediately put them back into the workforce and uh, so to fill those jobs that we, that we desperately need. You know, in a very recent meeting <clears throat> of the Small Business Commission, uh, Secretary Maurice Jones, uh, economic development, mm -hmm. uh, worked with the governor, said to members of that commission that when they're trying, to, from the state level, working with localities to, to seek to get businesses to locate, number one issue is workforce, mm -hmm. yep. is, is a prepared workforce. Comes right back around to education. It does. Yep. Comes comes around to what type of education. Uh, Kim, you were saying again before we before the show started that the push used to be back not too long ago. To everyone to college, college. Everyone to mm -hmm. college. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I mean since I've been on the board, that was a, a thrust in our strategic planning. I was like, we can't focus on every student going to college because. One, it's not a reality. Two, it's not a smart way to, to train everyone. I think that there, there are viable jobs that don't require a college degree. Um, we have um, recently announced a partnership with the Ford Corporation. Um, they are going to be working on career and technical programs with Richmond schools. And um, one of the specialties they talked about is cybersecurity. We were talking about a little bit about cybersecurity earlier. So we are shifting our focus a, a little. We, we still have that college track for students who wish to pursue that, but we are focusing on career readiness for students who we know may not be able to afford to go to college or um, really can, can find a reasonable job that pays well without having that college tuition bill hanging over them. <laughs> you know, cybersecurity has certainly been a, a hot topic. Uh, the governor, who, with those who agree and, dis and those who disagree with some of his political policies, I think there's, there's agreement that he really is someone selling Virginia, selling jobs. And I think I saw recently, he wanted to see Virginia to be the cybersecurity capital to really to have, to, and so it's going to require it at the, at the public school level, K through 12 level, as, as well as in higher ed too, as well. What about other issues? Now we've dealt with, with ones that you probably have worked on the most yourselves, but you've all been around and you've seen issues that are coming up. And again, for, for the viewers, who may have interest in each of these issues, but they've got some other issues they're interested in. And here it is, the first week in January, the session's going to be convening. What's, what's the message that people need to hear around the Commonwealth that will helpfully prevent them from saying in mid-March to their legislators, why did you not do this and why did you do that? because I'm sure that's what legislators hate to hear when they haven't really, haven't heard from their constituents. You know, David, um, what I've noticed in, in working around Capitol Square, that um, many times uh, folks start too late. Uh, the session begins you know, in the middle of January, and, uh, and then as we spend some time around Capitol Square, we see the folks coming in their carpools and their busloads and that kind of thing to, quote, lobby. But frankly, at that point, all you can do is reinforce what should have been done right, before session. Right. And so the bottom line is a time to start is now. In fact, the window might be uh, closing by the yeah. time um, by the time we're uh, folks are watching this, uh, the door will have closed, and you're now in reinforcing mode. But to say what can folks do? Talk to their legislature. Talk to them early. Talk to them early. If there's a concern, make sure that it's on the radar of your legislator early enough that that legislator can do something about it. Yeah, or especially um, get involved with the local chambers, which most of them sponsor special legislative receptions or uh, uh, panels or uh, events, some type of events where uh, the businesses especially can come out and, and meet with the delegates and address certain particular issues involving either their business or that particular area of Virginia or whatnot. But, 
that formats, you know, there in place. But yeah, but mainly pick up the phone call and uh, pick up the uh, phone and make a call to your delegate or senator and let them uh, let them hear uh, what's on your mind. You know, in thinking about those different forums that occur, mm -hmm. some of them are happening this week between January 1st and January the the eighth or ninth. They're they're happening in different localities. So it may not be too late if someone does some checking and saying when, when is when are the Northern Virginia legislators have when is our when is our group of legislators having a forum that we can attend? So that okay. those those opportunities may exist even as Charlie was saying the window is closing before January thirteenth. Mm -hmm. Kim, what were you going to say? Well, I think um, in Richmond we are pretty fortunate to have two local school board members who recently got elected to the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. So I think that they bring a perspective that other legislators coming from different walks of life may not have. So, you know, issues specific to the Richmond area, um, I think we we battle some of the same issues that a lot of the rural communities do. Um, our facilities and infrastructure is a major, a major um, stumbling block for us because we just don't have the funding to to be able to bring these buildings up to par. And I think you've seen it with um, having to relocate polling places um, because the schools aren't sufficient for um, getting people in and out. So um, I think that that's something that I, I really believe should be looked at at the state level. How, how do we get our schools up to the 21st century standards across the state um, and get children out of trailers and modulars um, and really have adequate facilities so that we can bring them up, up to speed academically. And you were referring to the two new legislators, one in the House, Lamont Bagby, right. mm -hmm. who while he was on the Henrico County School Board is from the region, represents, and he represents, represents part, of, well. part of Richmond, and Glenn Sturdivant who yes. uh, will be vacating his seat on the yep. City of Richmond School Board to, to uh, join 39 other colleagues in the Senate of Virginia. So there will be people with with some recent passionate experience in education who will be joining each chamber. Mm -hmm. Now, what what else can we tell them? Oh, let me, let me mention, sometimes viewers, if they watch every week, they may be seeing me holding one of these. It may be because I've got my notes on the back side. <laughs> but around this time of the year, we let them know that, viewers know that if they'd like to have one of the directories, they can receive one compliments. Compliments of this week in Richmond, all they need to do is just send an email to TWIR for this week in Richmond at capitalsquare.com and they'll get one free of charge and compliments to try to get them more involved. So I did want to mention that I'm holding this not just because I've got notes on the back, but to let, let people know that uh, they can get a hold of a directory. The online system for the legislative services seems like it improves every year mm -hmm. for tracking bills. And uh, all people have to do is just Google, if they don't have the address, the General Assembly of Virginia, and they've got a great website. They'll, it'll take them to all kinds of information online that would be helpful to them in what they're trying to do. This is a good tool to track the legislators. Um, all the contact info is there. You can walk around the General Assembly building during session and see folks uh, with their little red book in their hand stepping right. off the elevator to find out where to go. But it's a, it's a very good tool. It's got all the full color photographs, which is what I like in there. Photo ID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. So you could recognize the, the, the legislators. Yes. And Especially the new ones. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Seven new out of the 40 in the Senate and 11 new out of the 100 in the House. So there's, there's, there's quite a quite a few new people to uh, to learn uh, as, as and hopefully the people back in those districts they know Lamont Bagby or they know right. Glenn Sturdivant they know the ones and and uh, we have a little three-line poem that we try to go by we're not poets <laughs> but it starts off saying elect no strangers and that is we encourage people to know who's being elected and then the second line of the poem is if possible, elect friends, because people want to elect someone that is friendly to their position, whatever the position is. But then the third line really comes into play now that the elections are in the past, and that's 
if not, make friends of those elected. And it's time around the Commonwealth, the legislators will be gathering to, to govern. They've done their politics to get elected in a governing time, and, it's, and, and they represent everyone in their district. Mm -hmm. Those who voted for them, those who voted for somebody else, and those who unfortunately didn't take the advantage of the right to vote, didn't go out and vote at all. They represent them, mm -hmm. and they all want to represent them. But they've they've got to hear got to hear from them. Mm -hmm. So the session starts on the thirteenth. It's going to be an interesting uh, session. Uh, well, every even numbered year session tends to be interesting because it's budget, so it's a longer a session, long session, and so it's all about the money, and everything points to the money. And as we all know, the budget trumps. There will be two thousand bills, which is not to say there are two thousand things wrong with Virginia. It's just that with that many members of the General Assembly submitting bills, the number of climbs, there's a lot of overlap, duplication, and that gets all filtered out. But the focus, I think, is going to be on, on the budget, obviously, because that's the, 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 the charge. I think you'll see some discussion on um, um, uh, the Certificate of Public Need in the health care. Yes, uh, right. There are two distinct opinions on that. And it's not necessarily the hospital association versus the other groups. It, among there, there's some diversion there about should you still have that, and that's that's that bears uh, looking into. Uh, I think uh, there's another issue that's kind of quiet, uh, David, that, that we might hear about about the uh, forfeiture of, of, of um, criminal assets. Yes. Um, which uh, there's some evidence that there might be some abuses, and maybe that needs to be uh, tightened up some, and that might get some headline, but we don't see anything that's going to really cause um, choosing up sides and, 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 and dare somebody over kind of a thing as much as we might have seen in the past. I think the uh, Medicaid expansion might be uh, discussed uh, the first couple of hours, <laughs> and after that it might just be absorbed into the other processes that are going on. Uh, that's what I'm hearing on Capitol here. What are you guys hearing? So the corporate tax reduction uh, proposal, which um, from six to five point seven five, I believe, but right. that's still not going to be lower than North Carolina, which is supposedly dropping theirs from five to four, first of the year. And in the economic development world, uh, of our biggest competitors, uh, North Carolina, it's where Virginia is always going up against North Carolina, and uh, so that's going to be uh, interesting to watch. And uh, but it, uh, McAuliffe is a, he is a good cheerleader. He's a good, <laughs> he's out there uh, knocking, uh, knocking on the doors and uh, he's a good one, uh, especially coming from uh, the Virginia Economic Development Partnership. Uh, and when you have a governor like that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a big plus when you're out there knocking on doors and trying to convince businesses to move to, move to Virginia. So you got to have the tools and the competitive uh, tools and incentives to I mean, it's talk is good and uh, cheerleader is good, but you got to have the tools and incentives to uh, lay on the table to uh, play the game, unfortunately. And uh, North Carolina is always the ones we uh, probably most of all the between Maryland and South Carolina and Tennessee, that's usually our hardest competitor. And so, Andy makes a good point, and sometimes that's not always noticed. It's like under the radar. But I heard recently, I heard just last week, that for the first time since the Second World War ended, Virginia lost population. People moved out more than they moved in. And I think that has a lot to do with what you've touched on here in mm -hmm. economic development, jobs. Uh, they go where the jobs are. Right. They go where the taxes are affordable <laughs> and so forth. So I think it's an issue that'll be front burner. Well, unfortunately, the government, uh, you know, we're so dependent on government jobs and defense yeah. contracting jobs and uh, those are being mm -hmm. reduced. So yeah. that's probably somewhere the uh, uh, the vacancies is showing up, uh, especially in Northern Virginia and even throughout, you know, Hampton Roads and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we're trying to, the, the governor's trying to change the focus towards cyber security or different industries that are the upcoming rather than uh, our, our uh, sole reality, uh, reality on uh, government, government jobs and defense jobs. I think it's always about the money <laughs> every, every <laughs> session. Um, but it, more emphasis in those even-numbered years. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is always about economic development, but I think we have to balance that with our public services and public needs and, and not give away the store 
mm -hmm. you know, per se, because as you said before, those corporations or companies look at the schools and they look at whether or not mm -hmm. we can produce. Kim, we've given yes. you the final word. And Sorry. Thank, thank, all, thank all three of you for being on This Week in Richmond. Thank you, each and every one. Thank you. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.